Hi guys! Welcome back to book club. Um, second book club of 2021. Very exciting. And it's a very special one because <laughs> we are doing Slave Play, um, which is a play, obviously, not a book, but um, I have, I think since I started book club, I just wanted an excuse to have Jeremy on. So this is truly like the greatest excuse ever. And i um, so happy to finally have my hands on a copy. I actually had the honor of getting to go and see Slave Play on Broadway before everything shut down. Um, and before that I saw Daddy and that was kind of my introduction to Jeremy. So this is just very exciting. And um, let's just bring Jeremy on so we can talk about it. I'm gonna fangirl. I'm just saying it now, I'm gonna fangirl, so. Also, I've run out of bookshelf space, so I'm spilling over right now. I have books all over my floor. Can't stop getting books. Um, so ignore what's happening back there. <laughs> I also just wanna say, for those of you who did get to see Slave Play, um, it's just such a incredible experience, but I also know that like still being able to read it and being able to sort of experience it is the best thing ever. Um, Jeremy's asking for seven minutes, so I can talk about Jeremy for seven minutes until he's ready. <laughs> so let me just, I just wanna preface, um, when I went and saw, I knew Jeremy, I knew kind of what his work was like because I had gone and seen Daddy um, and so, I, once I heard that Slave Play was running, I just really wanted to obviously go see it and I wanted to bring my mom, but no one, <laughs> Jeremy, <laughs> Jeremy said one sec. Um, I'll tell the story because I've already told Jeremy the story, but I was like, I'll bring my mom. And um, everyone who told me to go see it wouldn't tell me anything about it. They were like, just see it. Like, don't read anything, just go and see it. And I had no idea what it was about. Um, so I'm like, mom, do you want to see this play with me? And my mom and I have always been super into the theater. So we get all ready and we went to the theater, which I miss doing so much. And hopefully that happens again very soon. But we get all ready and literally within the first two minutes, I'm like, <laughs> I'm sitting next to my mom, just like, I'm so sorry. Um, but also I think, thankfully, like my mom and I are very close in that way. And um and neither, we were both kind of blushing, but I just think it was such an important thing to see, especially being able to see it with someone who has such a different generational gap. Like, it was really cool to be able to watch it with her and see how a lot of things have changed from generation to generation, but also have not changed. And um, and yeah, like we, immediately when it ended, we both kind of were like, and like looked at each other and I remember my mom demanding that Jeremy have a Q&A after because we just wanted to talk about it. And <laughs> she says she loved it. We really did. And we still talk about it. We reference it almost every single day. Um, and it just impacted us so much as I know it impacted everyone who has seen it. And um, yeah, and so we went and talked about it for three hours, me and her after. And I just was completely blown away. I would have seen it a million more times. I hope that, you know, people do get to go see it eventually because it is so incredible and to have a young playwright you know coming out of all of this is just like the coolest thing ever and I feel like we really needed a Jeremy so thank you Jeremy I can keep talking about you until you're ready <laughs> um I also I don't know how in-depth we'll get into the actual premise of the play because it is kind of something where you don't want to give it away like you really just want people to read it or go see it because there are all these sort of Easter eggs that happen in the first act where you don't really know what the play is about. And um, those were one of my favorite parts was like seeing sort of Easter eggs hidden in to this first act of the play. I don't want to give it away um, where you're like, that doesn't belong in this time period. And then you kind of realize what's going on. Um, but that was a very enjoyable experience. And I think that's why like actually getting to see it visually is really 
interesting, but I also think like you get the same feelings from reading it and it sparks the same conversation, which is a very important conversation. Jeremy was so ahead of his time in, you know, working on this, you know, he's been working on this for a long time and then everything happening with Black Lives Matter, I think just even gave it a bigger platform to the issues that Jeremy was talking about, whether it's casual or systemic racism, um, things that happen every single day. And just because they're happening at a smaller scale between like person to person does not mean it is not a much larger issue. So I liked that Jeremy chose to focus more on, you know, the smaller casual racism that's faced every day, because I think that gets overlooked a lot. And I think being able to acknowledge that, especially as a white person going to see it, um, being able to have it sort of laid out for you, it I think is very eye-opening for a lot of people. And I think it's very important to have these conversations that might be a little bit uncomfortable to have. I like that Jeremy does not shy away from these sort of conversations. So, um, and it's the same thing with Dottie. Like, I didn't know anything about Jeremy when I went and saw it and I just left being like, I want to know everything about this person and everything that this person has to say and talk about, um, even if they're told through TikToks and the pandemic, which we'll get to because I have a lot to say about Jeremy's coronavirus mixtapes. Um, oh, let's bring Jeremy on now that he's ready. I mean, I could have talked forever. Hi! Hi. <laughs> Did you like my introduction about you? I was, it was like, I mean, honestly, it was so sweet. I feel, so I was up writing until 8 a.m. And I was like going, I had set my alarm to wake me up at like noon to do some <laughs> stuff. And I woke up at noon and I was like, you know what? Fuck that, I'm not doing it. I'm just gonna so take just another gonna... quick nap. And I just woke up at 4 p.m. exactly for Wait, you. Wait, you literally woke up just now? Yeah, my body was like, it's time for Kaya. And I was like, wait, but I'm late. Oh, good morning. <laughs> How Honestly, God. though, it's good to know that you actually are like up all night writing as like a playwright should be. That's what I expect. Yeah, no, I, I'm a full night writer. It's it, This is my little office space. So I'm like here. And it was great to wake up and get energized hearing someone speak so kindly about <laughs> you and their like experience with your work. Um, uh -huh. Well, I feel like yeah. I was lucky enough to... I was 17 when I saw Daddy because that was two years ago. So I was lucky enough to like have experienced your work from such a young age and like just to be able to follow you has been so cool. It's so insane to also hear someone who's so eloquent say like, I was 17 when I saw you. I was like, wait, what? <laughs> like your eloquence belies like much, uh, much, many more years on this earth. So that's Aww. amazing. Thanks. Well, I love that you're a night writer. I didn't yes. know that about you. Yeah, I mean, I think that um, there are a lot of my favorite writers have talked about this, but like, I think that I get my best ideas when I'm close to um, an REM cycle in some ways. So oh, cool. like, so okay. I feel like, you know, I'm dreaming as I write a bit. Mm -hmm. That makes sense, actually. Huh. Um, yeah. Okay, so I was telling everyone how I'd seen Daddy before I saw Slave Play. Was Daddy written before Slave Play? Yes, so you yeah. saw it in the right order. Okay, um, unlike good. most people in New York. Um, Daddy was a play that I wrote. It was like the first long play I wrote. Like I had written um, two other like smaller plays. I had started and stopped a lot of plays, mm -hmm. but like I had this idea for a play for like three years. And I was like, I want to write this play called Daddy. And, um, and I knew that and that play was based a lot on my experience of living in LA and feeling so, um, so both like othered and fetishized by like life in LA. Like mm -hmm. LA is a wildly um, segregated city. It's so true. And like, a lot of people don't think about that. Yeah. Um, and I think that being one of the few black, like queer people that was in the part of LA that I was in, mm -hmm. I felt like a certain group of LA gays, white gays were like, you are ours. Like, we are going to take you around, blah, blah, blah. But like, didn't realize how weird that might feel and how objectifying yeah. that might feel as like the only black person. Right, right. So that was it's interesting play. because I feel like LA is considered a more, you know, like the LA is with the times and everything. But when you live here and I grew up here, it's very much so apparent that it is not necessarily as, you know, 
ahead of the times as everyone thinks it is. Yeah. So I loved watching it because I felt like it reflected so many experiences that people don't realize happen in LA that I've seen. So. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I love that you said the use of the word reflected because you know so much of the play was about this like spectacle of the pool. Mm -hmm. and, like, I love the, the pool. pool the infinity pool. Yeah. It was such a wild experience to like say to everyone as like a young playwright, like, oh, my first play, I want there to be an infinity pool on stage. Has that been done before? Because that. I remember walking in and seeing the pool and I was like, and it was an off-Broadway play and I was like, is there a pool, an actual pool that people are jumping into and <laughs> swimming on a stage? Yeah, I mean, I think that one of my, the play Metamorphosis mm -hmm. by, um, by, uh, why am I forgetting her name? She's so fucking famous. Mary Zimmerman was like a very important play to me as a kid, was like yeah. seeing this play about the Greek myths and there was like a sort of um, lap pool on stage. So okay. I'd always been like, pools on stage are possible. But I think yeah. that like most people would say that like the pool in Daddy is like a very big different, yeah. it's a very it's different like, it's type like of pool character. than most people like see on stage. Is... Yeah, yeah, well I love that. And um, I know you went to Yale School of Drama. Yes. <laughs> so is that, was that like going into Yale, were you like, this is what I want to do, I want to be a playwright? Like what made you get into the theater? Yeah, so I was an actor first. So okay. I started as an actor when I was like, uh, you know, in high school. And then I went to a conservatory in Chicago for acting. And then I lived in LA and was like pursuing acting. And then I think I realized one day that like, I didn't like, the lack of agency one feels as an actor. And I'm mm -hmm. sure you probably feel this way as a model sometimes too, mm -hmm. where it's like, the parts of it that, that are thrilling are so thrilling, but the parts of it that feel completely outside of your control mm -hmm. um, and feel so at odds with your spirit make mm -hmm. you make it so draining. So draining, yeah. Yeah, so especially I when that outweighs the other. Exactly. So I just decided to take some time off and just try writing my own things because I felt so the thing that made me feel the most drained was the fact that uh, the roles I was getting asked to do were so bad. And I was like, I don't like, I don't want to be in bad things. Yeah. Um, so let so, me create uh, actual I'll, good roles that actors would want to play. Yes, I'm sorry. I'm like, I'm such an observant person and just like laughing at some of the comments. Like they're very funny. Um, they get so distracting. I try to look at them <laughs> so every once in a while I'm like, okay. I try but, uh, to like avoid them. Exactly. Um, um, but, but yeah, I, I feel like it's so cool because watching your plays and even just reading them, it's like all of them are parts that I think would be really exhilarating for an actor and really challenging and just an incredible role that like any actor would dream of playing. Like I always tell people when they ask me about you, I'm like, I play like a crack in the sidewalk in one of Jeremy's plays. Like they're just so amazing. Oh, sh dude, that's so, I'm like, that's really... <laughs> Because, like, I work really hard to make sure that, like, there are no small parts in one of my plays. Mm -hmm. Like, I want mm -hmm. each of the parts to feel like, even if you only have 15 lines, like, yeah. they're the best experience you have doing 15 lines you could. Um, so that means a lot to me. Thank oh. you. But, but, yeah, basically, I just, like, was, like, I want to write. And I, Lena Dunham was really popular then, obviously. Mm -hmm. And I knew that I wanted to be uh, someone that had the agency that I felt she had in making girls. Mm -hmm. um, but like the pathway towards being someone who writes or directs your own TV show um, was more so like making films or making a sh right. short. And I didn't know how to do any of that. And I was like, mm -hmm. well, what if I just went back to basics and started writing plays again yeah. and like put myself back in that space. Yeah. And that's when I started writing plays. So then I wrote Daddy mm -hmm. and then I thought Daddy was gonna be this way for everyone to be like, you're in. And everyone read Daddy and was like, we like this, but no one was going to just produce some play that I'd written. So I, um, because I had, no, I had no other plays. So right. then I uh, used that play to apply to grad school and I got into every school I applied to and, this, and Yale was one of those schools. And when I, when I applied to Yale, the main reason I applied was that like, the only reason I was able to write Daddy was because I got to take, two months off and write it at the McDowell Colony. And when I was at McDowell, um, one of the women that was there was like, Jeremy, like, you're so good. Like, you need to keep doing this. I was like, yes, I just need to keep going to residencies every other month. And she was oh, like, okay. no, Jeremy, why don't you go no. to grad school? Like, <laughs> That's like a residency for plays. three years. <laughs> <laughs> don't keep going residency. 
tendencies. Yeah. Yes. That's so cool that daddy was like your application, basically. Exactly. <laughs> that got you into Yale. I love that. It was um, the key that's opened every major door for me. Yeah. I mean, that's how we were introduced. And since then, I've just been like your number one fan. Um, <laughs> so when did you start writing Slave Play? I wrote Slave Play my first year, uh, first semester of my first year at Yale. So I had been thinking about Slave Play for about a year and a half. So mm -hmm. I don't know if you saw inside of the script. I have mine here too. But inside of the script, it says, um, to Maxwell Neely Cohen, um, the, uh, on the occasion of his 30th birthday, the only person who will love this play. Oh, yeah. So um, Maxwell took me to a birthday party or a Christmas party. I have a picture from that party. Um, and at that party, someone told a joke. Mm -hmm. And th when they told that joke, I was like, mm, that's an interesting joke. And so then I like pressed on it and mm -hmm. uh, pressed them on why they felt comfortable in that way. And it, was a, it, it wasn't a joke, it was more so like an anecdote about the comfort and excitement they felt um, having like sort of really kinky sex with their girlfriend at the time. And I was like, that's so interesting that you're telling this story like without her here and like, you yeah. know, giving us all these details. And like, um, I don't know you that well, so. Exactly. Yeah. And I was, I, was, I was like, you also just like very proudly telling us all about like how you were like a male feminist. He's like, well, I am. I was like, I'm not saying that it's not feminist to have like kinky sex at all. I'm saying that like, you know, it just feels very interesting, like sort of like that you're relaxation you have. The narrative, yeah. Yes. And I was like, well, I was like, you know, I was like, and again, something that's so funny to me is that I totally understand why like a woman would be like, I have a fantasy that like you break into my apartment and do X, Y, or Z to me. Because like, that's probably a fear she lives with all the time. And she wants to control that. I was like, it's harder for me to imagine like you being excited to do this thing that you could just do anytime. Yeah. And he was like, well, no, that's not how it works. I was like, let me just put it like this. What if she was, like, a Black person? Mm -hmm. And, like, she, the thing she wanted was not only for you to do all these things you just done that were so hot for you, but she also wanted you to say, like, the N-word, too. Like, mm -hmm. because, like, that's something she walks around afraid of. Yeah. Like, would that excite you? And he's like, no. I was like, why? You just said the thing that excites you is yeah. getting off your partner and doing what yeah. she wants. So, like, why wouldn't that excite you? And he's like, that just sounds really fucked up and crazy. And I started laughing, and I was like, oh, my God. Like, but, like, so, yeah. Okay, and then I was like, I have a play. Yeah. And so from there, I, I thought about that play for like two years. I told Max about the play, and he's like, you have to write it. I was like, no one will ever want to see that. And he's like, doesn't matter, I will, I'll pay to see it. And so I wrote <laughs> like, it. Like, all right, I'll write you this way. I love that. I also think that things that are not written or made so that everyone goes and sees it, they're always the ones that are the most important <laughs> and have the biggest impact. Yes. And like, yes. I also love that it is super unsettling to a lot of people who see it. Um, and like, even I remember on opening night, you did the blackout, as you called it. And so many people had so much to say about that. Yes. And, um, and you were like, are you kidding me? Like, it just was such an interesting reflection of how far we think we've come. But actually, you know, the places that those are the people that actually need to go and see it. And I just loved that because I thought like you didn't have to actually say anything. You just like see the play and it kind of did the work itself. Yeah. I mean, I think that that was something else that was really special about the production was that um, because of my own interest and my own, like, uh, my own, like, proclivities, it sort of became very difficult for the play to not exist as, uh, with the, as a meta commentary on the way in which we produce plays. Mm -hmm. Like, I made it, um, so that, like, on Broadway, you know, over 15,000 tickets were, like, under $30, so that, like, people who were, like, working which class would see it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And like, you know, privileging, you know, do you know that like, when you go see a play on Broadway, there's that marquee and it'll be like, this, the New York Times said this, or like such and such said <laughs> that. Well, like, I wanted to make sure that like a black or brown critic was the first critic you saw. Yeah. Like, um, and I also wanted to privilege like women who had seen the play. Cause I was like, well, listen, like the things people might've heard about this play that they might not, that might make them not want to see it is that like women don't like it or like women of uh, people of color don't like it and i was like but well, we know that a lot of people of color and really great publications liked it yeah and i was like but our new york times critics were all white dudes so can we just put on the cut on the side like soraya mcdonald's like yeah. um line um or vincent cunningham's line and ev that was such a huge fight like you have no idea really? how crazy it was yes wow. because like we don't know how to not privilege not only mm -hmm. the New York Times, but also like the idea that we were saying we're not privileging them because they're white men. Like people were like, but isn't that racist? And I was like, 
N no. No. <laughs> the best of it. That's not how that works. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's interesting, too, because the theater is, I feel like, one of the oldest forms of storytelling that mm -hmm. still exists, thankfully. And I'm so grateful for that. And so it probably is you have to battle even deeper than most people do because it does go so far back in history. And I know you talk a lot about like the American landscape of theater and you do a lot of work around that, like selling the tickets for under $30, which I think everyone should do. Um, but what parts of American history like are you most interested in telling? Like I know you talk about the Harlem Renaissance and stuff in interviews. Yeah, I mean, also I just got this new candle yesterday and I'm very into it. Oh. I can't. Can you see the name of it? No. Wow. What is it? Um, oh, okay. It's called, it's called uh, Koki Koki. C-O-Q-I, um, <laughs> C-O-Q-I. Okay. I'll send you one. Um, oh my it's God. very young. But, um, but the, for me, I think that like so much of American history is really exciting. And I think the difficult thing about being a black writer and looking at all those different parts of history is that like, I'm not saying that like anyone else didn't have a stressful time in history. But I'm saying that, like, when you're a person of color or queer, oh, the babies. But when you're a person of color or queer, and you try to think of like, what were like the hip hop popping times in history? Like, very few of them are like pretty great. You know, it's like if you're a queer person in the 1920s, it's like, yeah, you could have gone to like some of those like swinging um, orgies in the Weimar Republic, but you also would have been like a gay person in Germany right before the Holocaust. You know. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think the same thing is true when you think about the black, uh, about the black experience. Um, but even so, I think one part of American history for black people that is so unexamined and should be um, examined so much more is um, uh, the the re reconstruction. Like the entire period of time post world um, the Civil War mm -hmm. was like a wildly radical time for Black Americans. Um, we don't, and we do not like that is completely just combed over. Like we combed do over. not learn that. And I went to a public school in California, and it was basically like, you know, this happened. There were slaves, and then Abraham Lincoln. And then everyone was happy and free, and that was yes. It. And no one talks about the fact that after Reconstruction, there was like a real like EDI effort in our country where everyone was like, whoa, it's so fucked up what we did to black people. Like we need to elect them to higher office. We need to give them better jobs. And so like, I mean, this wasn't everywhere. So like someone's like, blah, blah, blah. Um, uh, no, sir, the system is racist. Um, <laughs> I you saw are too. <laughs> someone was just like, the system isn't racist, you are. And I'm like, nope, the system is racist and apparently so are you. Um, but anyway, the, the at, right after the um, the election, uh, or after the war, there were more Black people elected to higher office than have ever been in American history, like, even more so than there are now. And, like, there, that was, like, when, like, the advent of, like, Black university started. And, like, mm -hmm. real sense, a real sense that, like, Black um, equality or Black equity could be something that we could um, have in this country. And right. then, um, like, right at the end of Reconstruction, a lot of white people were like, this is really yuck. Like, it's kind of crazy that these people that we are, that are literally below us, like, are trying to say that they, like, are the same. So let's, like, create new laws that make their so lives they, like, harder. they, like, overcompensated, and then they're like, oh, actually. Yeah, actually, we hate progress. So, like, <laughs> let's, like, fuck them over and create Jim Crow laws and, like, yeah. all sorts of other really insane zoning and, like, legislative laws to keep them behind us so insane yeah. and it's so insane that this isn't being taught that's why like even for me to go see your play and with my mom there were so many things in there that neither of us had heard before and so that's mm -hmm. why i think like you walk away super eye-opened even just on like casual racism that you know fortunately like i feel like you kind of happened in lieu of like well then blm sort of became this huge thing it's not like it didn't exist before but it was definitely more amplified this year you know, kind of right after I'd seen Slave Play and everything. How do you feel like that sort of tied in some of the topics that you were discussing in Slave Play? I mean, it, what was really interesting was, was to see how um, casually a lot of them were reflected in the world and the way in which you discussed it. Like, you know, as you know, one of the major monologues in the play, 
that mm -hmm. caused a lot of people like frustration and ire like older white people i heard walking as either like how dare he he said that white people were racist or we were a virus like this is so insane and then like on cnn i was watching cnn while the riots were happen happening and i forget which commentator said this but he was like white supremacy is it, it's a virus it's a virus it's a virus just like Corona. And it's been in our country for much too long. And I was like, wow, that's so weird. Cause I said the same thing in my play. Um, and then, uh, then there was like all those people who like, I think felt from the play, this sense of like, um, uh, of ownership and like re, uh, re like they fell back in love with their bodies as black people, mm -hmm. you know, after being told they were less than for so long. And I think that like going to protests and wearing and saying things like, and having signs that said, I am the prize, like really affirmed something mm -hmm. for me. Um, yeah, that but, they were using your words and your yes. language like to empower. I think that's it. Like, that's like the greatest gift. I think that probably anyone can give you and that you can give the world is that now you're being used to empower an entire group of people and generations that have not felt empowered in the past, which is just. Yes. And I think that a lot of like a lot of allies, I think um, that are white and or non black in general, like had already been feeling these things and already been trying to figure these things out. But I think that like the play gave them different languages and different um, a different pathway in to do that work of being an ally and like making sense of it for other people in their lives, people of older generations, people in their own generation who maybe like have their own blind spots or weaknesses for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. And I think that like there was something about the way in which slave play worked that became like a great tool for allies as well. Oh, um, which definitely is kind of cool. for me, I felt like it gave me, I like already had that foundation of knowledge from seeing slave play and I was already focused on like okay where are the places that I've been wrong in the past or that I've contributed so I feel like that gave me a really good like foundation to then build on when I wanted to be an ally for this movement I was like thankfully I have this basically like it was like an outline to follow for how to be mm -hmm. a good partner how to be a good ally and how to like stop the issue and not contribute to further racism yeah and so much of the play is so simple like it's like basically like it's like listen none of us are going to figure out how to stop um systemic racism mm -hmm. none of us are going to figure out how to like end white supremacy but you know one way we could start is by listening to black people and specifically yeah. black women that's literally yeah. the thing just listen just listen and i loved that kind of in the sort of middle of the play when they're asking for everyone to explain their experiences and i don't want to give away too much i'm going to try to speak like kind of broadly but everyone to share their experiences and the people that we heard from first were all the non-black partners and um and it was just interesting and i thought that was like a really good sort of example of how oftentimes black people feel silenced by people who are also like will be speaking on behalf of them but you can't speak on behalf of someone else's personal experience and i thought being able to like when you finally do get the chance to hear from all of the black partners and the couples you realize that the white people have it wrong <laughs> and they think that they're doing them a favor and they think that they know exactly how they're feeling but they absolutely don't and i think everyone should practice that what was really funny working on those on that scene or those scenes was like how naturally that writing came out of me right. like it was like i i just like closed my eyes and was like what would happen in this situation and there were very few situations where i couldn't see or imagine very easily the white people in my life being the first people to speak like for good or bad you know it's like it's like just like because i feel like that's so much so often how we've been socialized yeah. that like it's almost impossible not to want to be like no i have something to say and it's really yeah. important because you know? as a white person you're told that like your voice always matters you're not silenced you're so you're not conditioned to take a step back and allow others to speak and i think like when I heard that part and then hearing the actual individual experiences of the black partners, you realize that they actually have something really important to say. And if you just like sit back and listen, it's so simple, you know, yeah. and like to be a good ally is just to listen and allow them to speak. And um, especially like, I felt like the dynamic between Jim and Kanisha, um, when Kanisha finally says like, no, I need you to recognize 
and I need you to see me like because he's like I don't see your color and that's I think that's a big issue as well people who are like well I don't see color it's like well then you're denying an entire experience and do you feel like exactly. you've experienced that in your especially like going to you know Yale School of Drama and being in theater which is predominantly white do you feel like you've experienced that a lot I think growing up in the South, there was a moment and like a big shift for some people in my life where they were like, oh my God, Jeremy, like you're not, I don't see you as black. I see you as Jeremy. And they would say it as this like gift to me as though like that was something that like I should like aspire towards as their um, race blind uh, sort of like vision of me. Mm -hmm. And um, I had to, uh, and, and and I think being younger, I also aspired to some colorblind world. Um, mm -hmm. And then when I realized that like that sort of colorblindness also allowed those people to ignore the like facts of my body and the facts of my experience, mm -hmm. it started to become something that I realized was actually a bit more violent than was intended. Right. Because like oftentimes um, it felt as though um, as a yeah as a kid i would be like yeah but like did you hear that thing that like you know uh mrs fletcher said and then everyone would be like yeah but like she didn't mean it like that jeremy i'm like but i i don't i don't know what you don't think she meant to like but this is how i heard it right and they're like jeremy just stop that's so silly like don't make such a big deal out of it like telling you how you should feel and how you should exactly respond to certain things and that's like it's such a personal thing i mean across all fronts but yeah i, I completely and i think that like this play if anything that does the biggest job of depicting like we cannot answer for an entire different group of people like and we cannot dictate what their experience was like no matter how much we try to erase history or brush over it in schools which completely is happening and hopefully stops happening soon um but if you just sit back and listen it's always so simple like the part with Philip and he's like, I've, you know, I was just Philip. Yes. And, and I actually thought that was really interesting because there is a part of, I think, growing up where people are like, well, you're colorblind and it doesn't matter and we don't see color. But that actually ends up being detrimental, I think, to a lot of people. Completely. I mean, think of how many girls you know who have been like, sort of like, and I could totally see this being a space that you fit into, been like, you're just one of the boys. Like, blah 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 and like yeah. they like sort of like degender you in order to like continue doing gendered violence to you <laughs> you're just like exactly. whoa that's crazy wait it's so on. true this is giving me this weird lag so i have to jump out and then jump back in I think. okay come back yeah. we're gonna bring jeremy back on hopefully <laughs> I actually have, like, yet to find a way where these don't have technical difficulties. Um, but hopefully we can bring Jeremy back on. Okay. There we go. All right. We're well, back in action. I've literally yet to find a way to do these where I don't have some sort of technical difficulty, so. What, what, what's been the worst technical dif difficulty that's happened so far? I've had it where someone's screen just like turned off halfway through and I didn't say anything because I thought it was just me. <laughs> like I thought my phone did something weird. So I was like, I'm just not gonna say anything. I'm just gonna keep talking even though I can't really hear them or wow. something. Wow. And in hindsight, I probably just should have said something yeah like hey <laughs> hey like i can't hear anything you're saying i was trying to have like a full conversation couldn't hear a word but thankfully we figured it out um that's why yeah you were talking about like women's experiences and i think that whole thing of like no you're just one of the guys like obviously i didn't mean it like that um where it's like well no i want to be seen as a woman like i don't <laughs> want to be seen I don't want to have to act like a man and do, to get that respect. It's like, you should see me in my personal experience. Yes, yes. And I think that like, you know, that's one of the, I mean, I grew up as like the son of um, 
a single mother as the as the older brother in the room and is like the one boy in a land of women. Like my mother literally owned a hair salon. So like oh. I literally just like sat in a salon um, from from like childhood till like I graduated high school, just listening to women tell their stories and talk <laughs> about their lives. Not to mention the fact that like, you know, when you grow up as a little gay boy in the South, often, um, women can be your like, not just in the South, but anywhere, women can be like your safety, right? Like they're right. the girls that bring you in to like a group in middle school. They're the girls that like protect you during high school. Mm -hmm. um, so I've been very, um, my ear had been very attuned to like the lives of a lot of the women in my life. Um, and I spent more time listening than speaking to them most of my childhood. So I felt really excited to write Slave Play after I'd written my play Daddy and after I'd written my play Water Sports, which are plays that really actively explored Black gay male experience. Um, although Daddy has like a major like arc for a mother, right? Mm -hmm. um, but like after those plays, I really was excited to sort of like step into the sort of like tricky historical space of like being a man writing um, writing in and around like the experience of a woman, like the harrowing, like complicated experience of a woman mm -hmm. um, as like an experiment for myself to see if I would fail or if it would be possible for me to like distill this language or these these um, histories that I had collected over the years right. into uh, the character of Kanisha. Right. And it felt really amazing to see that people really responded super well to it. Like yeah. in a lot of ways, Slave Play is the reason I got to write Zola for Janixa. Uh, yeah, because I was like watching it, I felt like Kanisha was just such a solid character. Like, you knew exactly who she was. It all felt like it was told from personal experience, which makes so much sense now that you're saying that it was. But And then being able to go on and write Zola and also congratulations on now being able to adapt The Vanishing Half because I actually had Britt Bennett on um, on book club and I just absolutely adore her and I adore that book and that's another you know story of women so what a cool way to like continue being able to tell these stories that you're clearly very capable of telling. <laughs> I mean the thing that's really excited about uh, the way we're doing um, Vanishing Half is that I also get to get a twin when I write that story like Mm -hmm. It's like me and Aziza Barnes are writing it together. And Aziza is like another playwright. And weirdly, Aziza's first play that was produced on uh, Off-Broadway to like, you know, huge success was a play called Blacks. And her director was Robert O'Hara, who was my director of Slave Play, my first play that got produced. So it feels like we have the same sort of creative father yeah. who like Aww. worked us in the same season, which, you know, feels like twinship. And, mm -hmm. um... And yeah, that play, that book is so wild to explore because of how um, expansive it is. I have, I have a question for you about that because we will go back to my play first. But I've been thinking about fans, and what what are things when you imagine like Vanishing Half turned into a TV show? Mm -hmm. What are what's like what's two things that you're like these must be there, um, no matter what? Mm -hmm. Oh. I can't believe I'm like getting to talk about this. Um, I think like the biggest visual for me was just really understanding how differently their lives can go. Like I think being able to understand, you know, how one ends up basically passing for white and showing that two of the same people basically from the same place, the way that the world can treat you based on how you present yourself. It just was so interesting for me. And I think it comes up in Slave Play too, even with James's character, how James talks about how, you know, and James and, and Gary, and they're saying like, you can, Gary tells James, you can pass as white. So you've mm -hmm. never been anything but closer to white. And I've never been anything but black. Mm -hmm. And like mm -hmm. that dynamic, which you already talk about with, I think such sensitivity, but also just so incredibly in Slave Play. Like, I think if that's brought into, the vanishing half like to me that was just so interesting and that was like what really i was visualizing when i was reading it okay amazing okay <laughs> you're asking me no it's so crazy i mean because like obviously you know we want to take big swings and allow the tv show to be something that the book isn't mm -hmm. um but we also recognize that the book has like fans and like yeah their foundational like things about loving a book that like 
I think become universal. So I've been trying to ask as many people as I know who like the book, like, right. what are things that are important to you? Like, what can't we miss? Right. It's so interesting, even because my mom came to me the other day and she's like, I'm reading a really good book right now called The Vanishing Half. And for me to hear that my mom, obviously, who's a lot older than me, is interested in these topics and, you know, was more than willing to come see Slave Play and recommended it to all of her friends to go and see it. Um, yeah, and now to be reading stories like this and then for you to be able to be telling stories like this, it's just like, I think this is how the changes are made is like, you want it to touch everyone. You want these stories to reach every generation. And yes. uh, do you feel like there's a pressure that comes along with adapting? Oh, 100%. <laughs> I mean, I think that, you know, I'm already getting it now. I mean, I guess that maybe uh, there was a leak of Zola that went out or something that some people were like, I saw Zola like on Twitter. And again, I shouldn't be looking up what people think of things I've written. <laughs> we're all but good. Apparently, um, but apparently someone did. And um, and it was kind of funny to read some of these like uh, responses from like literal teenagers who were like, this wasn't what Zola was like. Like the, the Twitter thread is this and the movie is this. And I was like, well, first of all, yeah, they are different and they're mm -hmm. different aesthetic journeys. And like mm -hmm. one of the things that's exciting for me about adapting, especially the work by black women, is allowing the work of black women to like um, to be to be treated with the same sort of like um of uh, recognition and um reverence that like the work of so many white artists that get adapted are mm -hmm. is that like when a white auteur takes like a great novel they're like the reason i'm taking this is because i want to put my stink on it and make sure that like it like lives beyond itself that way it has a full life as a film it has a full life mm -hmm. as a book mm -hmm. like i'm not taking anything away from it by like yeah. by like put adding my own beat and rhythm no, to it the becomes thing. its own being yeah yes and um i've tried to do that a lot with the things that i've adapted um because i think that um i want to recognize that like if i'm doing the work of a master and a black master that i want them to have the respect of me saying like oh you've already mastered your storytelling now right. let me attempt to like meet your storytelling by taking as big of swings as you took in your book or your twitter thread as I'm going to do in this film. I love that. I love that because especially when it has such a following and an audience and a fan base already, it's like you want to make it its own entity when you add your personal touch to it. And I think you'll absolutely you, love that. It's so exciting. It's funny. It's so cool. I'm looking around. I'm trying to see if I have any of the books in here. I think they're all in my bedroom. Um, as you can see, my, my library is like, uh, my office is really messy, but um, fuck. This oh is like my desk. But like actually me too. <laughs> and then this is my like crazy little um Wow. Oh, I need a bookcase. I'm I'm overflowing. Yeah, it's really bad. But um the thing was I was looking for um some of my theory because I have like a lot of black theory. Mm -hmm. And in a lot of ways slave play is my adaptation of black theory. Mm -hmm. Um like a lot of the black theory I was reading and the queer theory I was reading at um at Yale, and um, actually, let me just look it up for you. So if you all go to the Slave Play website, um, my dramaturg and I, Amal to Marston Firmino, who is the hottest dramaturg in the country, um, <laughs> Google him, he and I, um, we created like a sort of reading list for everyone of like basically all of the theory because yeah. I was going to ask, I was like talking about Black Theory, like what are the top books that you recommend? But if you have a list. Oh, I have a full list. Hold on, I'm plugging in my laptop. Um, I have a full list, but um, the more importantly than the list is uh, um, the things that are in my soul. So I'll tell you those right now. So mm -hmm. get ready, um, write, get a pen and paper. So um, Hortense Spillers, Mama's Baby, Papa's Maybe. That is... A, a like a perfect like specific like wow. um text that like has been so important for me okay. um scenes of subjugation by sadia hartman okay um i'm gonna make a list of these and like post it so that people will actually read them <laughs> feeling brown and feeling down by jose munoz okay and then um, Fred Wilkerson, which this one isn't on that list for some reason. Fred Wilkerson's Red, White, um, what is it? Mm. 
Oh no, maybe it's Jared Simpson. Um, I don't. One second. One second. Uh, I'm gonna get this book. One second. <laughs> this is a playwright, everyone. <laughs> this is why I love Jeremy. His brain is like an encyclopedia. In this book, this book is so important. <laughs> okay. Oh, red, white, and black. Okay. Yeah, I've seen that one. Frank I've definitely seen that one. It's so, so good. The essay in that movie about um, Monster's Ball will, like, blow your brain away. Um, <laughs> but if it's half of what Slave Play did, I'm reading all of these. <laughs> it's very, yeah. So, but, like, I really, I feel like um, I got so lucky with academia and in the sense that um, academia afforded me sort of a, an ability to put language, complex language to like emotion that I felt my entire life. Mm -hmm. And yet like so often I recognize as well that many people didn't have access to like a Yale or a NYU or wherever education. And um, often when they met this the work, it felt really dry because they weren't used to reading theory. So right. like, what if I distilled this theory into language that my mom would understand, right. that my cousins will understand, that people right. who didn't go to graduate school can right. make who sense don't of. have all the tools to put words into how they've been feeling their whole life. Yes, right. yes. That's, I mean, I, I even think it works for white people too, like reading, slave play or watching it it puts into words a lot of the things that you've experienced and noticed and you know probably been first firsthand had experience too and then you get to see it kind of in front of you and I think like that is an incredible gift of being able to storytell the way that you can is like putting all these experiences into words that everyone will understand like me my mom the old man next to me, like the kid in front of me and like being in the audience. It was also funny, I will say like, obviously when you read it, you don't get this, but hearing the different times that everyone laughed, like at what points each audience member laughed during the course of your play, I think was so interesting. And was that intentional? Like to hide sort of hints in there of like where black people laugh, where the white people laugh, like. I think I didn't even think about it like that because I feel like I have such a fucked up sense of humor yeah. that I think I was laughing for everyone at every beat, you know? And I think the audience was um, processing it very clearly along racial lines in mm -hmm. ways that like really surprised me. Like, mm -hmm. you know, seeing that like, uh, seeing people watch the play and look over at the older white lady who just laughed at something like a black couple looking over at the older white lady who just laughed at something they didn't think was funny and yeah being like, what the fuck and then like oh like the older white lady being like um um wait what and like being like it's just like all of it being like this sort of weird tennis match of laughter yeah. Yeah. that coalesced into this sort of like awkward silence when act two began and people realized that like some that? of the anger they were feeling wasn't like matching what the play was doing and other people being like oh wait I feel weird that I was laughing as much as I was because now I'm realizing the joke might have been on me that all of that together yeah um was what excited me yeah like that alone was a social study I feel like just sitting in the audience yes which yes. is so fun and before we get cut off I also want to talk about the awesome work that you've been doing we're going to talk about your TikToks too, but first we're going to talk about <laughs> the amazing like organizations that you've been working with to community build. Like, can you talk a little bit more about that? Because when I saw that you were doing that, I was like, this is my sign to have Jeremy on because you just never cease to amaze me with like how I feel like you're trying to community build within literature and within theater in like an area that re it really hasn't been accessible to everyone in the past. Thank you. Um, I think for me, I've always had to think of um, theater as a community-based practice. Like, it's like, you know, why do theater and not just do film? Like, why did I decide I didn't want to, like, take the time out of my life to raise $5,000 and, or $15,000 and make a short film mm -hmm. and go to South by Southwest or Sundance with it? Because I could have. Like, I literally know for a fact I could have. That wouldn't have been difficult for me. Right. And I think it's because I enjoy the, um, sort of, uh, the community aspects of theater making more so than I enjoy anything else. Like, mm -hmm. um, I like the fact that like, 
when you make a theater, you, or when you make a play in the theater, like everyone's involved during tech. Everyone has like, um, everyone's hands are on deck for the entire process. And then when an audience comes in, you get to give it to like only the people basically that live in that town, right? And all those people are working together. So mm -hmm. I think that when, um, to understand this thing you made. So I think that when I saw the coronavirus happen, and I felt like a lot of the leaders in the theater had sort of abandoned our community. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to create a um, platform or a model for other people to figure out. Because I think that a lot of the reason why more work wasn't being done is because people felt despondent last March. Yeah. They, like, no one has ever had to imagine what life was going to be like um, in the middle of a global pandemic that shut down everyone. Like, we've never it's had literally, that. You know what it is? It's a Jeremy O'Hara's play, is what the Exactly. <laughs> it's it's like fucked up and play. social commentary and... Yes. Yeah. So, um, so in... I wanted to do something that, that thought about the community. And the first thing I thought about was the fact that most of my peers weren't able to afford like their rent and i was hearing that from multiple people mm -hmm. so i was like i want to make it possible for everyone involved to get 500 dollars uh like just to pay a bit of their rent and mm -hmm. not have to worry about that and just to and just because they are a playwright and so i did that i worked mm -hmm. at a small theater i gave up all of the slave play royalties um and then um it was really um yeah, it felt really good to see that, like, playwrights who had worked their asses off um, for the last couple of months and felt really sad and had no other things to do or didn't really know where to go um, had this, were like, oh, my God, like, this $500 changed my year. Like, it's changed how I'm seeing my time here. Mm -hmm. Just this little gift from the community. Yeah. And so then I started thinking, like, well, if we're going to work this hard to get, like, Biden and like Kamala Harris elected and they're running on like a leftist agenda. I hope that they're aware of the fact that like theater workers are workers as well. And theater workers do like need to be bailed out as much as the banks, as much as like almost every other job in the job sector has been. Yeah. Um, and so I started looking into like times where that ha that had happened where like, there had been theater bailouts or arts bailouts. And I found out that during the New Deal, um, FDR created a thing called Federal One, which is this huge block of money, like like billions of dollars that he basically gave to all, like he was like, if you are an artist, you can get some of this money. So like wow. painters got, so Jackson, the reason we have Jackson Pollock's is post-depression, he got this money. Mm -hmm. um, John Steinbeck mm -hmm. got, Federal Writers Project money mm -hmm. to write a play. And um, wow. and also um, Zora Neale Hurston got money to write her plays and her and do her research. Mm -hmm. So I was like, um, I think that we should do this again. This was the first time where we gave money to like people who were like, like and like it was all self-selection. Like you could just be like, hey, like government, I'm a theater worker in Nebraska. Mm -hmm. I have five other people who want to do a play. Will you pay for it in the theater? And, the, and, the, and they were like, yes, you're workers and you're doing an important piece of work that for our country. Be, yeah, yeah. And that also led to the first black theater companies in our country. In our country, like the first black theater companies came mm -hmm. out of the New Deal. Mm -hmm. So I was just like, I think we should start advocating for that. And yeah. it was sort of like on a whim. And then it started to take off. And there were other people in the theater world who were talking about this before me. There were people yeah. like, you know, Lear DeBessonet, um, Rachel Chafkin. Uh, there's a group called Be an Arts, uh, Be an Arts, Be an Arts Hero. Why did my brain just break? Um, and you guys should look at their advocacy work. They're doing like the most lobbying right now. Mm -hmm. um, and they are, um, they, and they're getting real legislation passed. But mm -hmm. I started um, talking about this more when I would go on these late night shows or do things like this with you. And they sort of like tapped me and were like, hey, like, can we all like get all these things together? Yeah, like we and all try to make this a bigger thing. thing. Yeah. yeah. And it's been amazing. Yeah. And such a good example to set because you are also a young playwright. And it's like to be able to already be doing this work for the community is just like, the coolest thing ever and i think that definitely it should be appreciated globally. well you 
you created a great model for like a great model you created a great model for young models to like you know put like to use their platforms not just to like be like look how gorgeous i am but right. also to like you know like bring in people from like different advocacy groups bring in people different activists and also to bring on artists like writers mm -hmm. which is something i think is so important i mean i um, just think it's so important like i'm someone who just i'm i'm always seeking more knowledge like across all friends all different artistic forms uh, you know everything that's why i read so much and i know you read a lot too so for me to be able to share some of like the access that i have to getting that knowledge like I also feel like a lot of people are always kind of sitting and waiting to be asked the questions that they want to be asked. And that was 100% me for a very long time. And when I realized that no one was going to ask me anything other than like, what are the five makeup things that you can't live without? I was <laughs> like, well, maybe I should just start talking about them and then people might listen. And fortunately they did. And now I get to have people like you on, which is just like a dream and um, makes me so happy. What's your, who's your dream guest? Like dead or alive? Like who would be like, I want them? Genuinely, and I'm not just saying this because you're on here, it was you. Like when I started book club, I was like, I just want to figure out a way to have Jeremy on, but I wanted it to make sense. I didn't want to just like do it just to do it. And so when I saw all the work you were doing and then I was like, I can actually get slave play and like have it in my hands. I was like, let's, let's do it. And it's February, so. Yeah. It's what amazing. Also, I mean, they people are going to start voting for Tony soon. It's fun. Like you, you might have just been the reason why Slave Play wins a Tony. You never know. I this mean, if I can have, if I can be of any assistance, <laughs> like that would be. I mean, and congratulations. It's so so. Thank cool. you. And before Thank we you. jump off, I really quickly need to talk about your coronavirus mixtapes because they have actually been sometimes the sole reason I've gotten through a day. Danny oh, Ramirez is going to be so excited. He just mentioned them. Um, yes. Yeah. So can we please talk about your carefully curated coronavirus mixtapes that were my introduction to TikTok because I'm like an old lady and didn't really know what it was about until you made me get TikTok. Yes. It's your fault. Um, <laughs> I, I wanted to make sense of how much I was taking in during the early days of corona isolation like i think that like we all um we all sort of like have been in like a sort of like content overload since last mm -hmm. march and i think that that's actually kind of like dangerous if we oh, aren't yeah. like looking at it in some diaristic way and being yeah. like okay like this is what i watched today this is what i did today and i had been doing a lot of um TM, like Transcendental med Meditation. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the things that you have to do, uh, part of my practice is like, like right before I go to bed, I list all the things I did in that day. And I started to realize I couldn't list how I spent like two full hours. Cause mm -hmm. I just spent two full hours going from like Instagram the to TikTok, like TikTok, to Twitter, to, to Twitter, and just like absorbing all of these videos mm -hmm. and not actually taking any of them in. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, okay, Jeremy, from now on, you're going to actually be very conscientious of like what you're watching and how you're watching it. Mm -hmm. um, and you're gonna like document it. And that's how it started. It wasn't even like a real, like, um, like I think some people see it as like more intentional as it is. And I think that it's intentional in the sense that like, my days tend to follow certain paths sometimes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, like I, um, it's generally just like um, sort of a collection of all the things I'm doing that day. Or, and like, I think now that I've sort of spread out how many times a week I'm posting on Instagram, mm -hmm. they're now being like a documentation of like things I've been watching for like the last week or so, mm -hmm. um, which also does make it a bit more cured tutorial in a way like <laughs> where sometimes it will be a thing where i'll be like oh like i'm talking about like the gay dudes and then i think that like um unconsciously it'll be like three funny things about gay dudes right. like, back to back you right. know but it's so, yeah. really been like a gift to me and i can speak for everyone i say it's just been one of my favorite parts of the pandemic is that you started doing fix type so thank you <laughs> please keep making them <laughs> i think i will i think it's been like the best part of our um of my time but also i found the website um hold on i want to um show the people this is be an arts hero oh yeah please yeah. check this out go to the website yes 
um, and help get your, um, like, let your, you know, leader, your state leaders know that, like, mm -hmm. these people exist and, like, our advocacy is real and that, like, people yeah. who make plays aren't just doing, like, bad productions of Oklahoma. No, like, they're also people who make plays are like you and they're very important and we love you. And we're probably going to get cut off in, like, 20 seconds. But I just want to say yes. thank you so much for coming on here. This is my dream, truly. Um, and thank we'll you find so time much. for another one soon. And I can't wait to see you when I'm back in, in L.A. I know. I'll give you a hug. Mm. Bye. Thank you. Bye.